So, this is the reason why I've been behind on my videos and too much behind on everything in general. Um, a week ago today, I wound up getting in a car crash. Um, I took my mom to work and I went back through town, made it all the way through, and I stopped at this gas station. And the gas station is at the bottom of a road called Bluff Road. And, um, the gas station is on the left side. I stopped there. I still had to go down the road and go to the dump before I could go home and take off the trash. Because I really didn't want that sitting in my car. So, I stop and I get the gas. And I go to pull out of the gas station. And right before you come to the gas station, heading out of Kingston and in towards Midtown, there's a really sharp curve, and right as you, like, before you get to that curve, the speed limit drops from 45 to 35. And, first of all, people never do the 45 through there. It's the four lane, it's, people do 50, 55, 60, 65. They treat it like the interstate, kind of. And, um, once you drop the speed limit, nobody drops theirs. Like, I, I don't know anyone who does 35 through there. Normally people don't start slowing down until they cross the bridge and we're going into Kingston because cops sit there like right as soon as you cross the bridge. There's this apartment complex and cops will sit there and wait for people to come flying across the bridge to give them tickets. And so I start to pull out and when I looked everything was clear. I'm already about a quarter of the way in the road and out of the corner of my eye I can see that there's a car going. I'm pulling out going left and the car's coming straight from the left around that curve and so I hesitated at first and I kind of stopped where I was and when I really looked I realized that there was more cars behind that and they were in both the fast lane and the slow lane so I decided to gun the gas and try to make it because I knew if I just sat there I was definitely going to get hit so I hit the gas and um, I drove and I say drove because I don't have my car anymore now. Um, I drove an Oldsmobile, an 88 Royale. And I don't know if anyone has ever had one of those cars. I mean, they're good cars for the most part. I've had a lot of problems with mine just because it sat in somebody's yard for six years and was never turned on, never drove, anything like that. But they really don't have that great a pickup. Um, it's not like I'm running a Hemi or something like that. <laughs> So, I made it almost so close to the other side of the road, and the guy in the car closest that was coming towards me, I guess he thought I was just going to try to stop, and he swerved over into the fast lane, and he wound up nailing me right in my door, and, um, like, my door caved in, and it knocked the air out of me, and I couldn't breathe. And I could hear the tires squealing, and I just, I closed my eyes because I was scared. And when I opened my eyes, I was in a parking lot across from the gas station, and across from that gas station, there's a dance studio. And my car was still rolling, and it was still running. So I put my car in park, and I'm looking around me. My airbag, for whatever reason, didn't pop out. It didn't deploy, and I have no clue what was wrong with it. Um, my window had shattered, the back window had, which makes no sense because it hit on my door and the glass had blew up into the car and was all over me and all over everything up there. Um, the paneling on my door had cracked and it was like sticking out and poking me and my seatbelt was on me but it was all loose on me. Like the, the paneling on my car up at the top, like there at the side where the seatbelt connects into the car that had cracked and busted and split apart and I guess that's kind of why the seatbelt malfunctioned like it did because like when his car hit me I got like sent over towards the passenger side of my car and then jerked back into my caved in door and everything that was like all pointy and sticking out there and all that glass and my windshield cracked and they ruled that scene as I did have my seatbelt on as it was just the crash it wasn't my head hitting the windshield and I don't remember my head hitting it I just remember the air getting knocked out of me and automatically my side started hurting really bad 
so I get out of my car because I'm thinking, you know, get out of the car before it like blows up or something. And I left the car running because I was so freaked out. And the other car has backed up to where I am now. And a guy gets out of it. And his car is like nothing compared to mine. It was some silver sporty car. I didn't even pay attention to what it was. But the damage to it is minimal versus the damage to mine. And I asked him if he's okay. And he said, yeah, I'm fine. But he tells me, don't call the cops. Because I've got to get someone down here to say that they were driving the car instead of me. And he tells me he doesn't have a license. And I'm like, what? So... At this point, I'm really freaking out about the baby now that I'm out of the car because I realize my side is hurting very badly and I feel like I'm going to throw up. So I go back to my car and I get in it like through the passenger side because you can't open my door. And I turn my car off because I realize it's still running and I get my phone out and I call 911 anyway and at this point some people have stopped in another vehicle and they happen to know this fella and they're telling him oh you're so you're so screwed you're going to jail all this other crap so I call 911 and I'm so panicky at this point that I can't even think of where I'm at to tell them I've lived here seven years I mean <laughs> and even before then I've been in this town a lot because my family lives up here <laughs> and so they use um, the GPS to find me and stuff and I told her that I was pregnant and so I um you know I told her how far along I was and stuff and she told me you know that um responders were on their way and so I get off the phone with her and I call my big brother because I know I need someone there and I just dropped my mom off from work so there's no way she could have gotten to me and I don't have any other family really close enough and my brother was like 10 minutes down the road at his house so I call him and basically tell him in a panicked sobbing mess that probably didn't make a lot of sense to him and scared him really bad that I needed him and so I get off the phone and that guy comes over to me and he's like did you call the cops and I was like yeah and he's like, oh, I really wish you hadn't have done that. i got to get someone to say they were driving. I can't. You know, I don't need this right now. And I'm thinking, I don't need this either. I'm pregnant. And I didn't say anything to him the rest of the time. You know, he didn't even ask me if I was okay. He's so concerned about going to jail is all he cares about. And getting someone there to say they were driving the car. And so a cop shows up within just a few minutes. And the officer automatically goes over to the other man. And he starts asking the other man for his license, registration, insurance. That guy's got nothing. No license, no registration, no insurance. And he's like, oh, it's my girlfriend's car. She's got all that stuff. So by the time the cops start kind of talking to me, I'm really freaked out now. And I'm really upset. And I'm really scared about the baby more than anything. I told the cop I was pregnant. And that pretty much just stops everything. And from there, stuff moves so fast. Like, I wound up being laid down, even though I'd already been up walking around and I knew I could walk. I knew, you know, I wasn't, you know, my legs weren't broken or anything. And I wasn't bleeding anywhere. You know, I was already getting some bruising showing up already. And they strapped me down on one of those board things and they put this collar on me. And they load me up in the ambulance. And my brother gets there, like, just as soon as they're about to take me away and he tells me that he's going to go get mom, and he leaves me, and they take me to the hospital, and that was the fastest I've, I've ever gotten anywhere, and when I got to the hospital, by the time I got there, I was kind of, not necessarily over the shock, but more it had set in how bad my side was hurting, like, from my rib cage, like right underneath my breast, and down onto my hip, and then my leg on the left side of my body, it was excruciatingly painful. And, um, I mean, there were no, no punctures, no anything like that on the outside. And so their main concern is that I'd gotten injured internally, and that maybe I'd punctured a lung or broken something, or there was 
you know, just something that they could not see outwardly. And the first time that I get to look at a clock is when I'm in a room in the ER and I'm waiting for the doctors to come back in with an ultrasound machine to check the baby. And it's about 5.15, so it's about an hour and 15 minutes after the crash had happened. So, um, it, it gets to be 6 o'clock and nobody has showed up. I don't have my phone on me. I left in my car. I don't have my wallet. I don't have anything on me. Nothing. It's all in my car. And I can't remember any phone numbers. They've given me something for the pain and I was having a really hard time just concentrating on thinking about things and I was just really upset and sick feeling. So they done an ultrasound on the baby because I wouldn't let them do anything to me first until they told me something about her. And she was moving, her amniotic fluid was good, um, heart rate was good, her placenta was good too, and so they told me, you know, that from what they could tell, she was fine, but they needed to check me. Um, I had them do an ultrasound on me first, because I didn't want the radiation exposure to her. So, they tried to do an ultrasound, and they couldn't see good enough. And, um, like in the ultrasound, they had, um, like, dark lines showing up on one of my kidneys, like on the left side. And I had bruising up above, like, where my kidney should be, and they were really concerned about that. And they were concerned up in my chest that maybe, you know, a rib had broken and had punctured a lung or something. So, I, in the end, I, um, I said okay to having an x-ray done. I did not let them do a CAT scan. They did one x-ray and it was like a low dose one of just my chest. And that turned out, you know, no punctures. They said that there could be a crack that they can't see because it wasn't that high powered. And by this point, my aunt has gotten there at the hospital. And she's with me. And then my mom gets there. And when my mom gets there, I was able to remember the phone number for my dad and have mom call my dad and tell him what happened. And... It's like five hours after the crash before I can let Sam know anything. Like, my brother talked the cops into towing my car to his house instead of having it impounded. So, I had my niece get in my car, find my phone, and pull Sam's number off of it to call him and tell him. And he didn't come to the hospital because it was really late at that point. Um, I spent probably about five hours in the ER, then running tests and looking at me and monitoring me and they finally sent me to labor and delivery and they hooked me up to machines up there to monitor me for any contractions because they were worried that um, I might go into labor from it. And it was probably going on one o'clock in the morning when they finally discharged me. So I spent the majority of my night in the hospital and it was about two o'clock when I got home that morning.